Before we start, let us first have an overview, of what we will be discussing for the next two hours. This will be our roadmap for this session's discussion. First, we will be defining what biochemistry is, its objective, and scope. Secondly, we will look into the importance of biochemistry, especially in the context of your study of medicine. Meaning why is it important for you to study it at your stage? Next, is we will review the chemical components of the cells, atoms, molecules, and molecular bonds. We have to go down to the molecular level, in order to fully understand how atoms can come together, to form molecules and molecules to macromolecules, and so on and so forth. Fourthly, we all know that water is a crucial part of all biological systems. So we will be spending some time reviewing the physical and chemical properties of water. Next, is we have to see how the pioneers in biochemistry, were able to study the different biochemical structures and functions of organelles. Thus, it is only prudent that we revisit subcellular fractionation as an important tool in separating, and isolating the different subcellular organelles. Following this will be a brief overview of the different macromolecules, that you will be encountering in the course of your study of biochemistry. And lastly, we will be familiarizing ourselves, with a very important biochemical principle that puts sense in everything, regarding biochemical pathways. This is the concept of compartmentalization, the cellular localization of both molecules and processes. Okay, I guess we are all ready. So dear students, sit back, strap on your seatbelts, and we will lift off to start your journey to the wonderful world of medical biochemistry. Biochemistry, can be defined as the science of the chemical basis of life. It came from the Greek word, bios, meaning life. The cell is the structural unit of living systems. Thus, biochemistry, can also be described as the science of the chemical constituents, of living cells and of the reactions and processes they undergo. This is what is commonly referred to as metabolism. By this definition, biochemistry encompasses large areas of cell biology, molecular biology, and molecular genetics. The objective of biochemistry is the complete understanding at the molecular level of all of the chemical processes associated with living cells. Biochemistry and molecular biology represent the study of the structures and processes that form the foundation for all living matter. They draw on techniques from biology, chemistry, and physics, providing a key interface between these fields. Biochemists and molecular biologists investigate all forms of life, such as viruses, bacteria, yeast, fungi, plants, and animals. Much of this research examines life at the cellular and subcellular levels. To order to achieve this objective, biochemistry involves the isolation of molecules found in the cells. Then determine these molecules' different processes. And analyze the functions of these processes. The scope of biochemistry is diverse and has been proven to be essential to the or crucial life sciences as well. The biochemistry of the nucleic acids lies at the heart of genetics. In turn, the use of genetic approaches has been critical for elucidating many areas of biochemistry. Physiology, which is the study of body function, overlaps with biochemistry almost completely. Immunology employs numerous biochemical techniques, and many immunologic approaches have found wide use by biochemists. Pharmacology and pharmacy, rest on a sound knowledge of biochemistry and physiology. In particular, most drugs are metabolized by enzyme-catalyzed reactions. Poisons act on biochemical reactions or processes. This is the subject matter of toxicology. Biochemical approaches, likewise, are being used increasingly to study basic aspects of pathology, such as inflammation, cell injury, and cancer. Many workers in microbiology, zoology, and botany, employ biochemical approaches almost exclusively. These relationships are not surprising, because life as we know it depends on biochemical reactions and processes. According to the World Health Organization, health is defined as a state of not merely the absence of disease and infirmity but in a more holistic way. It is defined in a positive way as a state of complete physical, mental, social, and even spiritual well-being. From a strictly biochemical viewpoint, health may be considered that situation, in which all of the many thousands of intra- and extracellular reactions that occur in the body, are proceeding at rates commensurate with the organism's maximal survival, in the physiologic state. Thus, simply stated, health, from a biochemical standpoint, simply means that all molecules needed for the optimal functioning of the body, exist in their appropriate amounts, and all the processes they undergo, are occurring in the most harmonious balance. In the same vein, we can now define disease, biochemically, as a state wherein there are abnormalities in the biomolecules, either in quality or quantity, 
and or the different reactions and processes, they undergo and participate in. With this in mind, when we look at diseases, I am sure, that you will agree with me if I say that every disease state has a biochemical basis. Don't you? The two major concerns of students and workers in the health sciences are first, the understanding and maintenance of health, and secondly, the understanding and effective treatment of diseases. Biochemistry impacts enormously on both of these fundamental concerns of medicine. As we will see later on in the following slides, the knowledge of biochemistry is important because it impacts profoundly in our search for knowledge in medicine. And naturally, a proper, if not a perfect appreciation of biochemistry and medical knowledge, will eventually lead to a rational basis and practice of medicine, which will redound to benefit of everyone. There is a reciprocal relationship between biochemistry and medicine that has stimulated advances in both. We will see in this slide that the search for knowledge in biochemistry and medicine affects the other. This interrelationship of biochemistry and medicine is a wide, two-way street. Biochemical studies have illuminated many aspects of health and disease, and conversely, the study of various aspects of health and disease, has opened up new areas of biochemistry. We can see many examples of this two-way street connecting both biochemistry and medicine. Knowledge of the biochemical molecules shown in the top part of the diagram, has clarified our understanding of the diseases shown in the bottom half. And conversely, analyses of the diseases shown below, have cast light on many areas of biochemistry. The study of nucleic acids has led to a lot of knowledge in the search for cures of many genetic diseases. On the other hand, studying genetic disorders, for example, certain inborn errors of metabolism, has led to a lot of enlightenment on DNA and mutations. Studying lipids such as cholesterol has led many inroads, to the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis and consequently, coronary artery disease. The search for breakthroughs in cardiology, has led not so few discoveries in the study of lipids. And of course, we cannot overestimate the importance of the study of carbohydrates, in leading the way to the diagnosis, management, and prevention of diabetes mellitus. And vice versa, the huge help in studying diabetes mellitus, in helping to understand certain sugars. However, what could probably be the best and classical example of the interrelationship of biochemistry and medicine is the study of proteins vis-a-vis -vis sickle cell anemia. We will be exploring this interesting interrelationship in the next slide. How can biochemistry impact on health and disease? Let's look at a classical example. Sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is a group of disorders that affects hemoglobin, the molecule in red blood cells, that delivers oxygen to cells throughout the body. People with this disease have atypical hemoglobin molecules called hemoglobin S, which can distort red blood cells into a sickle, or crescent, shape. The signs and symptoms of sickle cell disease are caused by the sickling of red blood cells. When red blood cells sickle, they break down prematurely, which can lead to anemia. Additionally, sickled red blood cells, which are stiff and inflexible, can get stuck in small blood vessels. These episodes deprive highly vascularized tissues and organs, such as the lungs, kidneys, spleen, and brain, of oxygen-rich blood, and can lead to organ necrosis and damage. What causes sickle cell disease? Mutations in the HBB gene cause sickle cell disease. The HBB gene codes for the beta hemoglobin. Hemoglobin consists of four protein subunits, typically, two subunits called alpha globin and two subunits called beta globin. The HBB gene provides instructions for making beta globin. In people with sickle cell disease, at least one of the beta globin subunits in hemoglobin is replaced with hemoglobin S. In sickle cell disease, hemoglobin S replaces both beta globin subunits in hemoglobin. Going deeper, hemoglobin S results when glutamic acid, the amino acid located in the sixth position of the beta hemoglobin, is replaced by a different amino acid valine. Later you will learn that glutamic acid and valine are amino acids that are markedly different in structure, property, and function. What causes the mutation, of this unfortunate, amino acid replacement then? The mutation stems when a simple nucleic acid base, is substituted by another, during DNA replication. A mere base substitution leads to an amino acid replacement, resulting in an abnormal gene that will code for sickle hemoglobin instead of normal adult hemoglobin. And with this simple base substitution results in potentially catastrophic events like severe anemia and permanent organ damage. From here we can see, that the structure and function of biomolecules impact profoundly on health and disease. We believe that most, if not all, diseases are just manifestations of abnormalities of molecules, chemical reactions, or biochemical processes. The major factors responsible for causing diseases in humans are listed in the table shown here. 
you can just browse through it to see the point that each and every disease does have a molecular basis. All of them affect one or more critical chemical reactions or molecules in the body. It is almost, if not, impossible to think of any disease entity or pathology that does not involve any biochemical aberration. Can you think of one? This is the roadmap to your biochemistry journey this year. This seems daunting and looks more like the map of a haphazard Metro Manila than anything else. So guys, take a deep breath, and take everything in. Don't worry, I am just joking. It is always better to break down complicated matters into smaller, more manageable, parts. Is this schematic diagram much better? This is a much simplified roadmap. But still, this seems daunting and looks more like a city map than anything else. But I am sure to some of you, some of the rotundas and boulevards here are familiar. You can clearly see here this roundabout near the center, which represents the citric acid cycle, and this boulevard here that feeds into it is the glycolytic pathway. And in this bottom area, what seems like a spiral going to nowhere is the beta oxidation of fatty acids. As you can see, the different components, or metabolic pathways, are represented in blocks or modules. This is how we're going to attack the myriad and complicated world of medical biochemistry. We are going to take biochemistry in manageable morsels, one by one, in an organized and methodological manner, so that, hopefully, no one will be left behind. But still, if we're going to look at it, biochemistry and metabolism, in specific, can still be simplified and will just basically boil down to this. Basically, the overall roadmap of biochemistry just involves generally two directions. The first is the breakdown of highly organized, complex, energy-dense substances like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. They are broken down into smaller, simple molecules like water, carbon dioxide, and ammonia. This process basically is energy-producing or exergonic, and is called catabolic. This process involves oxidation, or the loss of electrons from molecules. The energy produced is basically in the form of reducing equivalents like NADH and NADPH, and the high energy containing molecule, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. This chemical energy produced from the breakdown of nutrients is now used to synthesize cell macromolecules from simple, monomeric precursor molecules like monosaccharides, amino acids, fatty acids, and nitrogenous bases into carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, respectively. This process is energy requiring or endergonic and is termed anabolic. This is likewise reductive, meaning involving the addition of electrons into substances. Briefly stated, all organic molecules are synthesized from, and are broken down into the same set of simple compounds, the simple sugars, fatty acids, amino acids and nucleotides. Both their synthesis and their breakdown occur through sequences of chemical changes, that are limited in scope and follow definite rules. As a consequence, the compounds in a cell are chemically related and most can be classified into a small number of distinct families. These are then polymerized to constitute the larger, more complicated macromolecules like the polysaccharides, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, exemplified by DNA and RNA. The major functions of these biomolecules, which I am sure we are all familiar with, are enumerated in the last column of the table shown here. This table shows the major biomolecules, the building blocks for each and their major functions. Feel free to pause the presentation to read through the different items shown here. Now I guess, we are all ready to jump into the meat of the matter and dive directly into the chemical components of the cell. Moving on, let's now look at the cell and the different minutest components that make its existence possible. The characteristics of substances are made depend on the way their atoms are linked together in groups to form molecules. Therefore, in order to understand how living organisms are built from inanimate matter, it is crucial to know how all of the chemical bonds that hold atoms together in molecules are formed. Just think about it, we can only marvel at the miracle, of how inorganic and lifeless atoms can join together and form molecules. Molecules to macromolecules. Macromolecules to organelles and cells. Cells to tissues. Tissues to organ systems and finally to a living, breathing organism such as man. This section will now explore how such chemical components, atoms, and molecules, can eventually form a living organism. All living cells are composed of a set of elements. They are around 92 naturally occurring elements, but in biological organisms, there are only a number of elements that play important roles. 
the major constituents of most biomolecules, comprising 96.5% of all the atoms in an organism, are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element comprising almost 50% of all the atoms in a biological organism. Carbon and oxygen atoms come next, each making almost 25% of all atoms. Nitrogen comes a far fourth. Other elements, though minute in amount, play crucial roles in biochemical processes. Phosphate is a component of nucleic acids. Calcium plays a key role in innumerable biologic processes. Other constituents include iron, iodine, potassium, sodium chloride, and magnesium and they are usually encountered, in clinical practice in patients with various diseases. I've mentioned at the start of this lecture that we have to go down to, not only the molecular, even atomic level, but deeper even to the subatomic level. Just bear with me, everything will make sense in due time. It may not come as a surprise, but we all know that cells are just made up of a few types of atoms. What is an atom? The illustration shown here is representative of the atom. As we may remember, each atom has at its center a positively charged nucleus, which is surrounded at some distance by a cloud of negatively charged electrons. These electrons are held in a series of orbitals, by electrostatic attraction to the nucleus. The nucleus, in turn, consists of two kinds of subatomic particles, first, protons, which are positively charged, and secondly, neutrons, which are electrically neutral. To understand how atoms bond together to form the molecules that make up living organisms, we have to pay special attention to their electrons. In living tissues, it is only the electrons of an atom that undergo rearrangements. They form the exterior of an atom and specify the rules of chemistry by which atoms combine to form molecules. Other atoms found in living tissues all have incomplete outer electron shells and are therefore, able to donate, accept, or share electrons with each other to form both molecules and ions. Can you recall what the atomic number means? What is its importance? The atomic number, also known as the proton number, of a chemical element, is defined as the number of protons found in the nucleus of every atom of that element. More importantly, the atomic number uniquely identifies a chemical element. It is identical to the charge number of the nucleus. Thus, in an uncharged atom, we can also say, that the atomic number is also equal to the number of electrons. As shown, the atom on the left has an atomic number of 6. This means, therefore, that this particular atom has 6 protons in its nucleus. And if it is uncharged or is not an ion, it will also have the same corresponding number of electrons. In this case, 6 electrons as well. The atom on the right, on the other hand, represents the smallest atom. It has an atomic number of 1, thus it possesses only one proton. And consequently, if uncharged, only one electron, as well. This atom, hydrogen, is special because it does not possess any neutron. As an aside, one very useful tool in studying the different elements, their structure and properties, as a function of their atomic number is this website, the dynamic periodic table found at www.ptable.com. Feel free to browse and play with this dynamic table in your most convenient time. All living cells are composed of a set of elements. The major constituents of most biomolecules are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. The most abundant substance of the living cell is water, which accounts for about 70% of a cell's weight. As we all know, most intracellular reactions occur in the aqueous environment. Consequently, the interactions between water and the other constituents of cells are of central importance in biological chemistry. There are 92 naturally occurring elements, each differing from the others in the number of protons and electrons in its atoms. Living organisms, however, are made of only a small selection of these elements, four of which are carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen, that make up 96.5% of an organism's weight. Please do take note of the atomic numbers of these four very important atoms. This composition in living organisms differs markedly from that of the non-living inorganic environment, and is evidence of a distinctive type of chemistry. The most common elements in living organisms are listed in this table with some of their atomic characteristics. Let's now look at electronic orbitals. Electronic orbitals are regions within the atom, in which electrons have the highest probability of being found. The number of electrons in the outermost shell of a particular atom determines its reactivity, or tendency to form chemical bonds with other atoms. This outermost shell is known as the valence shell, and the electrons found in it are called valence electrons. In general, atoms are most stable and least reactive, when their outermost electron shell is full. Most of the elements important in biology, 
need eight electrons in their outermost shell in order to be stable. This rule of thumb is known as the octet rule. Some atoms can be stable with an octet even though their valence shell is the 3n shell, which can hold up to 18 electrons. To continue, atoms, like other things governed by the laws of physics, tend to take on the lowest energy, most stable configuration they can. Thus, the electron shells of an atom are populated from the inside out, with electrons filling up the low energy shells closer to the nucleus, before they move into the higher energy shells further out. The shell closest to the nucleus, 1n, can hold 2 electrons, while the next shell, 2n, can hold 8, and the third shell, 3n, can hold up to 18. Again, remember the octet rule, which we previously discussed. All the elements commonly found in living organisms have unfilled outermost shells, with the electrons shown in red, and can thus participate in chemical reactions with other atoms. For comparison, some elements that have only filled shells, shown here in yellow. These atoms are chemically unreactive, and are known as the inert elements. So naturally, there will be a lot of atoms with incomplete electron shells. Because an unfilled electron shell is less stable than a filled one, atoms with incomplete outer shells have a strong tendency to interact with other atoms, in a way that causes them to either gain, or lose enough electrons to achieve a completed outermost shell. This electron exchange can be achieved, either by transferring electrons from one atom to another, or by sharing electrons between two atoms. To continue, atoms can attain a more stable arrangement of electrons in their outermost shell, by interacting with one another in order to achieve a complete outermost electron shell. Remember the octet rule. This interaction between atoms can involve a transfer or one or more electrons from one atom to another. This will lead to the formation of an ionic or electrostatic bond. On the other hand, electrons can be shared between two atoms which will lead to the formation of a covalent bond. In chemistry, the valence or valency of an element is a measure of its combining power with other atoms, when it forms chemical compounds or molecules. Simply stated, valency refers to the number of electrons that an atom must acquire or lose to attain a filled outer shell. To have a clearer understanding of the different types of chemical bonds, let us illustrate the differences between an ionic and covalent bond. What is shown on the left, is an ionic bond that is formed when electrons are transferred from one atom to the other. We will look deeper into this in the succeeding slides when we discuss the different non-covalent bonds. On the other hand, a covalent bond is formed when electrons are shared between atoms. We will look into a specific example of covalent bonds within a particular molecule in the next slide. To continue, what is shown here is a molecule of methane or CH4. The illustration shows the completion of the outer electron shells of the atoms of hydrogen and carbon. Please take note that with electron sharing, all four hydrogen atoms have complete electron shells with two electrons. On the other hand, carbon, with atomic number 6, has only four electrons in its outermost orbital. Therefore, it needs four more electrons to satisfy the octet rule. In order for carbon to achieve a filled electron shell of eight electrons, each atom of hydrogen will have to share its lone electron. Thus, carbon will form covalent bonds with four atoms of hydrogen. A nonpolar covalent bond is a type of chemical bond that is formed when electrons are shared equally between two atoms. This is termed as nonpolar, because the difference in electronegativity is mostly negligible. And this type of covalent bond happens when the two atoms in the bond are either of the same atom, or of different atoms with a slight difference in electronegativities. To recall, Electronegativity is a chemical property that describes the tendency of an atom, or a functional group to attract electrons towards itself, and thus has the tendency to form a partially negative end or pole. In addition, the nonpolar covalent bond existing between two different atoms, is exemplified by the bond between carbon and hydrogen. Both the carbon and hydrogen atoms have similar electronegativities, and thus attract the shared electrons almost equally. On the other hand, when the atoms joined by a covalent bond belong to those with dissimilar electronegativities, the two atoms usually attract the shared electrons to different degrees giving rise to a polar group or molecule. By definition, a polar structure, in the electrical sense, is one with positive charge concentrated toward one end, that is, the positive pole, and negative charge concentrated toward the other, or the negative pole. Compared with a carbon atom, for example, oxygen and nitrogen atoms attract electrons relatively strongly whereas a hydrogen atom attracts electrons more weakly. Covalent bonds in which the electrons are shared unequally in this way are therefore known as polar covalent bonds. The best examples of polar covalent bonds are the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, and between nitrogen and hydrogen. 
A further crucial property of any bond, covalent or non-covalent, is its strength. Bond strength is measured by the amount of energy that must be supplied to break that bond. This is often expressed in units of kilocalories per mole or in kilojoules per mole. Typical covalent bonds are stronger than non-covalent bonds. The making and breaking of covalent bonds are violent events, and in living cells, they are carefully controlled by highly specific catalysts, called enzymes. On the other hand, non-covalent bonds, as a rule, are much weaker. We shall see later that they are important in the cell in the many situations where molecules have to associate, and dissociate readily to carry out their functions. In molecular geometry, bond length or bond distance is defined as the average distance between nuclei of two bonded atoms in a molecule. It is a transferable property of a bond between atoms of fixed types, relatively independent of the rest of the molecule. In stable molecules, the attractive and repulsive forces are in balance, and thus bond lengths are therefore dependent on the bond strength, which is influenced by the number of bonds between the atoms. Bond lengths are measured in picometers. A picometer is a unit of length in the metric system, equal to one trillionth of a meter. As we can see here, the greater the number of bonds between atoms, for example, in molecules with double or triple bonds, the stronger their bond strength is, and consequently the shorter their corresponding bond length is. Please feel free to pause the presentation, and take the time to associate the relationships between bond strength and the bond length. In aqueous solutions, covalent bonds are 10 to 100 times stronger than the other attractive forces between atoms, allowing their connections to define the boundaries of one molecule from another. But much of biology depends on the specific binding of different molecules to each other. This binding is mediated by a group of non-covalent attractions, that are individually quite weak, but whose bond energies can sum to create an effective force, between two separate molecules. We will now be meeting the four different non-covalent bonds or forces that make intermolecular interactions optimally possible. These are, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, van der Waals attraction, also known as London forces, and hydrophobic interactions. The first of the non-covalent interactions are ionic bonds. Ionic bonds are most likely to be formed by atoms that have just one or two electrons, in addition to a filled outer shell, or are just one or two electrons short of acquiring a filled outer shell. As animated here, an electron is transferred, for example, from a sodium atom, which has a lone electron in its outermost shell, to the outermost shell of another atom, let's say, chlorine, that is, in turn, lacking an electron. The sodium atom loses an electron, and thus becomes a positively charged sodium ion, or sodium cation. In turn, chlorine gained an electron, and becomes an anion, a chloride ion. Because of their opposite charges, sodium cation and chloride anion are now attracted to each other and are thereby held together by electrostatic forces. Thus, it is worthwhile to know that ionic bonds are also known as electrostatic bonds or interactions. Let's now look at how water molecules affect the strength and stability of ionic bonds. Because of a favorable interaction between water molecules and ions, ionic bonds are greatly weakened by water. Thus many salts, including sodium chloride, are highly soluble in water, dissociating into individual ions, such as sodium cation and chloride anion, each surrounded by a group of water molecules. This contrasts with covalent bonds whose strength is not affected by water in this way. The second non-covalent interaction is the hydrogen bond. What are hydrogen bonds? A hydrogen bond, often informally abbreviated as H-bond, is a partial intermolecular bonding interaction, between a lone pair on an electron-rich donor atom, like nitrogen or oxygen, and the antibonding molecular orbital of a bond between hydrogen, and a more electronegative atom or group. Or simply stated, this bond represents a special form of polar interaction, in which an electropositive hydrogen atom, is partially shared by two electronegative atoms. Unlike a typical electrostatic interaction, this bond is highly directional, being strongest when a straight line can be drawn between all three of the involved atoms. Do water molecules affect hydrogen bonding? Since water molecules are held together by hydrogen bonds themselves, it is expected that water will weaken hydrogen bonds, by forming competing hydrogen bond interactions with the involved molecules. It has been found out that hydrogen bonds are only one-fourth of its strength in water systems as compared to that of in a vacuum. The third of the non-covalent interactions are what is known as the van der Waals attractions, also known as London dispersion forces. Let us look now into how van der Waals attractions come into being. 
van der Waals interaction is a distance-dependent interaction between atoms or molecules. Unlike ionic or covalent bonds, these attractions do not result from a chemical electronic bond, they are comparatively weak and therefore more susceptible to disturbance. The van der Waals force quickly vanishes at longer distances between interacting molecules. To illustrate this further, the electron cloud around any nonpolar atom will fluctuate, producing a flickering dipole. Such dipoles will transiently induce an oppositely polarized flickering dipole in a nearby atom. This interaction generates an attraction between atoms that is very weak. But since many atoms can be simultaneously in contact when two surfaces fit closely, the net result is often significant. Please take note, that these so-called van der Waals attractions are not weakened by water. The last of the non-covalent forces is that of the hydrophobic interactions. The hydrophobic effect is the observed tendency of nonpolar substances, to aggregate in an aqueous solution, and subsequently excluding water molecules. This force is caused by the pushing of nonpolar surfaces, out of the hydrogen-bonded water network, where they would physically interfere with the highly favorable interactions among water molecules. The hydrophobic effect is responsible for the separation of a mixture of oil and water into its two components. It is also responsible for effects related to biology, including cell membrane and vesicle formation, protein folding, insertion of membrane proteins into the nonpolar lipid environment, and protein small molecule associations. Hence the hydrophobic effect is essential to life. Because bringing two nonpolar surfaces together reduces their contact with water, the force is a rather nonspecific one. This slide tabulates the effect of water on the strength of the different non-covalent forces, or attractions. Take note which non-covalent bonds are mostly affected by water, and which are not. Also, it is worthwhile to remember that, in contrast to the effect of water on the non-covalent forces, water has absolutely no effect on the strength and stability of covalent bonds. Please feel free to pause the presentation in order to see and understand the effect of water on the different types of bonds. Now, let us move on to the next section of this lecture. We are now going to discuss an absolutely crucial part of life. Water. The source of all life. Water is a polar inorganic compound that is by far the most studied chemical compound. It is described as the universal solvent and the solvent of life. It is the most abundant substance on Earth and the only common substance to exist as a solid, liquid, and gas on Earth's surface. Life on Earth began in the ocean, and the conditions in that primeval environment put a permanent stamp on the chemistry of living things. Life, therefore, hinges on the properties of water. Thus, it is of primordial importance that we spend some time in looking at the structural and functional features of water and why it is crucial in biological systems. Water accounts for about 70% of a cell's weight. And most intracellular reactions occur in an aqueous environment. As most of us already know, water is a polar inorganic compound that is composed of two atoms of hydrogen, that are linked together to one atom of oxygen by polar covalent bonds. To continue. The two bonds of a water molecule are highly polar, because the oxygen atom is strongly attractive for electrons, whereas the hydrogen atom is only weakly attractive. Consequently, there is an unequal distribution of electrons in a water molecule, with a preponderance of positive charge on the two hydrogen atoms, and of a negative charge on the oxygen atom. Water molecules form hydrogen bonds with each other and are strongly polar. This polarity allows it to dissociate ions in salts, and bond to other polar substances such as alcohols and acids, thus dissolving them. Its hydrogen bonding causes its many unique properties, such as having a solid form less dense than its liquid form, a relatively high boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius for its molar mass, and high heat capacity. Moving along. In a water molecule, both hydrogen atoms are on the same side of the oxygen atom. As a result, the side of the molecule with the two hydrogen atoms has a slight net positive charge, whereas the other side, the side of the oxygen atom, has a slight net negative charge. Because of this separation of positive and negative charges, the entire molecule has a net dipole moment. Because they are polarized, two adjacent water molecules can form a linkage known as a hydrogen bond. Again these interactions are caused by the electrical attraction when a positively charged region of one water molecule, that is, its hydrogen atoms, comes close to a negatively charged region, that of oxygen, of a second water molecule. Although hydrogen bonding is a relatively weak attraction, compared to the covalent bonds within the water molecule itself, it is responsible for a few of the water's physical properties. 
These properties include its relatively high melting and boiling point temperature, resulting in more energy required to break the hydrogen bonds between water molecules. The extra bonding between water molecules also gives liquid water a large specific heat capacity. This high heat capacity makes water a good heat storage medium or coolant and heat shield. Molecules of water are joined together transiently in a hydrogen bonded lattice. Even at 37 degrees centigrade, 15% of water molecules are joined to four others in a short lived assembly known as a flickering cluster, producing a network in which hydrogen bonds are being continually broken and formed. Again, this cohesive nature of water is responsible for many of its unusual, but biologically important properties, such as high surface tension, specific heat, and heat of vaporization. In comparison, hydrogen bonds have only about 120 the strength of a covalent bond. They are easily broken by the random thermal motions due to the heat energy of the molecules. Water is known as the universal solvent. This is such because of the dipolar structure of the water molecule, which we have just discussed. Therefore, organic molecules possessing ionizable groups or polar functional groups can dissolve in water. In contrast, nonpolar compounds are not soluble and cannot be dissolved in water. We will examine these phenomena when we go to the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity of different substances. Molecules carrying positive or negative charges, such as ions, interact favorably with water. Likewise, molecules with a lot of functional groups, that are either polar or charged, interact favorably as well. Such molecules are termed hydrophilic, meaning that they are water-loving. A large proportion of the molecules in the aqueous environment of a cell, necessarily fall into this category, including sugars, DNA, RNA, and many proteins. On the other hand, hydrophobic, or water-hating molecules, are uncharged and form few or no hydrogen bonds. Hydrophobic molecules tend to be nonpolar and, thus, prefer other neutral molecules and nonpolar solvents. Because water molecules are polar, hydrophobic substances do not dissolve well among them and often cluster together, forming May cells. This property is especially true for most of the hydrocarbons that contain many CH bonds. This property is important in certain biochemical structures like cell membranes and the like. One of the simplest kinds of chemical reaction, and one that has profound significance in cells, takes place when a molecule possessing a highly polar covalent bond between a hydrogen and a second atom, dissolves in water. The hydrogen atom in such a molecule has largely given up its electron to the companion atom, and so exists as an almost naked positively charged hydrogen nucleus. In other words, an H-positive ion or just simply a proton. When a polar molecule, in this case, a water molecule, becomes surrounded by water molecules, the proton is attracted to the partial negative charge on the oxygen atom of an adjacent water molecule. This can now dissociate from its original partner, and to associate instead with the oxygen atoms of the water molecule, to generate a hydronium ion or H3O positive. So in simpler terms, water molecules can dissociate to hydrogen ion and hydroxyl ion. Substances that release protons to form hydronium ions or H3O positive ions when they dissolve in water, are termed acids. The higher the concentration of hydronium ion concentration, the more acidic the solution. H3O positive ions are present even in pure water, at a concentration of 10 to the negative 7 molar, as a result of the movement of protons from one water molecule to another. By tradition, the H3O positive ion's concentration is usually referred to as the H-positive or hydrogen ion concentration, even though most protons in an aqueous solution is present as H3O positive ions. It should be noted, however, that most acids in the cells are only partially dissociated, and are thus, weakly acidic. On the other hand, the opposite of an acid is a base. Just as the defining property of an acid is that it donates protons to a water molecule, in order to raise the concentration of H3O positive ions, the defining property of a base, is that it raises the concentration of hydroxyl ions or OH negative ions, which are formed by removal of a proton from a water molecule. Thus sodium hydroxide or NaOH is basic or alkaline because it dissociates in aqueous solution to form sodium cations and hydroxyl ions. In the same vein, most bases in biological systems just partially dissociate, and thus are termed weak bases. In chemistry, pH denoting potential of hydrogen or power of hydrogen is a scale used to specify the acidity or basicity of an aqueous solution. Lower pH values correspond to solutions that are more acidic in nature, while higher values correspond to solutions which are more basic or alkaline. 
At room temperature, pegged at 25 degrees centigrade, pure water is neutral, neither acidic nor basic, and therefore has a pH of 7.0. In biological systems, the inside of the cells is kept close to neutrality but not to pH 7. The pH scale is logarithmic, and inversely indicates the concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. In other words, a lower pH indicates a higher concentration of hydrogen ions and vice versa. This is because the formula used to calculate pH, approximates the negative of the base 10 logarithm of the molar concentration of hydrogen ions in the solution. Moving on, biochemical molecules are defined both by their carbon skeleton, and by structures called functional groups, that usually involve bonds between carbon and oxygen, carbon and nitrogen, carbon and sulfur, and carbon and phosphate groups. As we have discussed and learned several slides back, in carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds, the electrons are shared equally between atoms. The bonds are considered nonpolar and relatively unreactive. However, in carbon-oxygen and carbon-nitrogen bonds, the electrons are shared unequally. These bonds, in turn, are polar and more reactive. Thus, the properties of the functional groups usually determine the types of reactions that occur, and the physiologic role of the molecule. Functional group names are often incorporated into the common name of a compound. For example, a ketone might have a name that ends in ON-like acetone. Similarly, the name of a compound that contains a hydroxyl, either an alcohol, or OH group, might end in OL, for instance, ethanol. The acyl group is the portion of the molecule, that provides the carbonyl single bond carbon double bond oxygen group in an ester or amide linkage. It is denoted in a name by an IL ending. For example, the fat stores of the body are triacylglycerols. 3-acyl, or fatty acid, groups are esterified to glycerol, a compound containing three alcohol groups. I strongly suggest that you brush up on your basic organic chemistry and look up the different important functional groups shown here. Before moving on to the biochemistry of the cell, we should investigate how the pioneers in biochemistry were able to isolate the different components of the cell, in order to study its structure, the enzymes and the processes therein. Also known as cell fractionation, the process is used to separate cellular components while preserving the individual functions of each component. This is a method that was originally used to demonstrate the cellular location of various biochemical processes. Other uses of subcellular fractionation are to provide an enriched source of a protein for further purification, and facilitate the diagnosis of various disease states. Biochemical research often requires the isolation of a particular subcellular organelle either first, to study the organelle intact, or secondly and more commonly, to isolate and study a specific substance from that organelle. And, in order to study the function of an organelle in depth, it is first necessary to isolate it in relatively pure form. To continue, subcellular fractionation involves, essentially the homogenization or destruction of cell boundaries by different mechanical or chemical procedures. This is then followed by the separation of the subcellular fractions according to different parameters. This may be according to the component's different mass, surface, or specific gravity. Subcellular fractionation generally entails three phases, extraction, homogenization, and centrifugation. The first phase involves extraction, also known as cell disruption. The objective of this phase is the maximum disruption of the whole cell, but minimum damage to subcellular compartments, particularly the organelles to be studied. This is achieved via various mechanical or chemical procedures. In order to achieve the minimum damage to the subcellular components, this is usually done in optimal and physiologic conditions, to prevent the loss of biologic activities of the cell. This is carried out by the employment of aqueous and physiologic solutions and avoidance of extremes of pH, osmotic pressure, and especially of high temperature. The second phase is that of homogenization. Once the cells have been disrupted, their constituents will be liberated into a buffer solution that is isotonic to stop osmotic damage. The resulting suspension is a cell-free system containing many intact organelles. This is known as the homogeny. The samples are then kept cold to prevent enzymatic damage. The third and last phase is centrifugation. This is the process of separation of the soluble cell fluid from the particulate matter, as well as the further fractionation of the latter in the homogeny. The different components are separated according to differences in their properties like mass, size, etc. This phase usually based on the principle of rate zonal centrifugation, which states that components in the homogeny have different mass to volume ratios and sizes and thus, will sediment under centrifugal forces at different rates. Therefore, heavier and larger bodies will sediment under low speeds and low gravitational forces. 
and consequently, lighter and smaller substances will require higher speeds and higher gravitational forces. Generally, the cellular homogenate is first filtered or centrifuged at relatively low speeds to remove unbroken cells. Then centrifugation of the homogenate at a slightly faster speed, or for a longer duration will selectively pellet the nucleus. We all know that the nucleus, measuring from 5 to 10 micrometers in diameter, is the largest organelle, and thus the first to precipitate out. A centrifugal force of 600 g, or 600 times the force of gravity for 10 minutes, is necessary to sediment the nuclei. This first fraction is known as the nuclear fraction. The undeposited material, or the supernatant, is next centrifuged at a higher speed, at 15,000 g for 5 minutes, which deposits the mitochondria, chloroplasts, lysosomes, and peroxisomes. This fraction is known as the mitochondrial fraction. Subsequent centrifugation in the ultracentrifuge at 100,000 g for 60 minutes results in deposition of the plasma membrane, fragments of the endoplasmic reticulum, and large polyribosomes. Subsequently, the recovery of ribosomal subunits, small polyribosomes, and particles such as complexes of enzymes requires additional centrifugation at still higher speeds. These fractions, containing the plasma membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, and polyribosomes, are collectively known as the microsomal fraction. And lastly, only the cytosol, the soluble aqueous portion of the cytoplasm, remains undeposited after centrifugation at 300,000 g for 2 hours. This is a simplified list of the different centrifugal fractions and their respective components. Again, the different centrifugal fractions, in the order of decreasing mass or density, are nuclear, mitochondrial, microsomal, and lastly soluble. Please do remember the different organelles or components belonging to each fraction. There are various ways in determining the purity of the organelles isolated from subcellular fractionation. This may involve processes that are not only tedious, but expensive and inconvenient as well, like electron microscopy. Additionally, several immunological techniques can be used with specific antibodies specific to the different organelle membrane proteins. However, what proved to be the most convenient and least expensive process to assess organelle purity is the use of certain marker molecules. Marker molecules are certain substances, be it may biomolecules or enzymes, that are specific for an organelle. A very good example is testing for DNA in order to determine if the organelle extracted and isolated were indeed the nucleus. The next slide will give us a list of the different maker molecules for certain organelles. Here is a tabulated summary of the different organelles, and the respective important markers, that are contained therein to assess the purity of the isolated organelles, from the process of subcellular fractionation. Feel free to pause the presentation to read through each and every item. The next section is the biochemistry of the cell. This part of the lecture deals with the different components of the cell, specifically the organelles and their respective properties, and more especially, their functions. We will also be including in our discussion certain biochemical aspects of these components, and the different biochemical pathways contained therein. The cell, coming from Latin word cella, meaning small room, is the basic structural, functional, and biological unit of all known organisms. A cell is the smallest unit of life, the smallest entity that is capable of metabolic processes. Additionally, cells are often called the building blocks of life. Additionally, cells, though microscopic, are regarded as the complex unit of life, since they are highly organized entities consisting of separate and distinguishable parts each performing important functions in the overall living process. There are two types of cells, eukaryotic, which contain a nucleus, and prokaryotic, which do not. Let us now go to the different components or organelles that comprise the cell. The first of this is, the nucleus. The nucleus is a membrane-enclosed organelle found in most eukaryotic cells. It contains most of the cell's genetic material, organized as multiple long linear DNA molecules, then complex with a large variety of proteins such as histones to form chromosomes. The genes within these chromosomes make up the cell's nuclear genome. The function of the nucleus is to maintain the integrity of these genes, and to control the activities of the cell by regulating gene expression. Let's now look more closely at the structure of the nucleus. The main structural elements of the nucleus are the nuclear envelope, a double membrane that encloses the entire organelle and keeps its contents separated from the cellular cytoplasm. And the nuclear lamina, a meshwork within the nucleus that adds mechanical support much like the cytoskeleton supports the cell as a whole. 
It is a double membrane containing phospholipids, which serves to segregate the nucleus from the cytoplasm. The inner nuclear membrane defines the nucleus itself, and the outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The space between the inner and outer nuclear membrane is continuous with the lumen or inner cavity of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The nuclear pores. Because the nuclear membrane is impermeable to most molecules, nuclear pores are required to allow movement of molecules across the envelope. These pores cross both membranes of the envelope, providing a channel that allows free movement of small molecules and ions. The movement of larger molecules, such as proteins is carefully controlled, and requires active transport facilitated by carrier proteins. Nuclear transport is of paramount importance to cell function, as movement through the pores is required for both gene expression, and chromosomal maintenance. The nucleolus is a very electron-dense suborganelle of the nucleus easily recognized under the light microscope. The current belief is that the nucleolus is the site within the nucleus where ribosomal RNA biosynthesis occurs. The nuclear organizer, a region of one or more chromosomes in the nucleolus, contains many copies of the DNA that direct the synthesis of ribosomal RNA. The nucleolus is roughly spherical, and is surrounded by a layer of condensed chromatin. No membrane separates the nucleolus from the nucleoplasm. The nucleoplasm Throughout the nucleoplasm, considered to be the non-nuclear region of the nucleus, there appear regions of less electron density, particularly near the nuclear membrane. These regions are termed chromatin, and are known to contain the major portion, 95% or more, of the total DNA found in the cell. Functions of the nucleus The nucleus is the site where genetic information is stored as DNA. It is also the site of DNA replication, thus ensuring the perpetuation of the cell line. This is also the site where genetic information is transmitted from to the rest of the cell. The next organelle in our discussion are the mitochondria. These are rod-shaped particles with a length of 1.5 to 2.0 micrometers. The mitochondrion is approximately a twentieth of the size of the cell nucleus. Although mitochondria are found in virtually all eukaryotic cells, the size, the shape, and number vary from cell to another in response to shifts in metabolism and as a result of cell aging. Certain generalizations can be made regarding the number of mitochondria per cell. In cells characterized by a high degree of aerobic, or oxygen-dependent metabolism, the number per cell might be quite large. In contrast, Cells participating primarily in anaerobic, or non-oxygen-dependent metabolism, contain only a few mitochondria. Like the nucleus, the mitochondria is bounded by a double membrane, two unit membranes, separated by an intermembranous space. The two membranes, however, have different properties. Because of this double-membraned organization, there are five distinct compartments within mitochondria. There is the outer membrane, the intermembranous space, or the space between the outer and inner membranes, the inner membrane, the Christie space, which is formed by enfoldings of the inner membrane, and the matrix or space within the inner membrane. The outer mitochondrial membrane, which encloses the entire organelle is smooth and continuous. It has a protein to phospholipid ratio similar to the eukaryotic plasma membrane, which is about 1 is to 1 by weight. The outer mitochondrial membrane contains numerous integral proteins called porins, which contain a relatively large internal channel measuring about about 2 to 3 nanometers, that is permeable to all molecules of 5,000 daltons or less. Larger molecules can only traverse the outer membrane by active transport through mitochondrial membrane transport proteins. The outer membrane also contains enzymes involved in such diverse activities, as the elongation of fatty acids, oxidation of epinephrine, and the degradation of tryptophan. Let's now proceed to the inner mitochondrial membrane. This membrane undergoes an extensive and irregular folding within the mitochondria. The inward folds are called Christi. The fluid-filled interior of the mitochondria is called matrix or central space. The inner mitochondrial membrane contains more than 100 different polypeptides, and has a very high protein to phospholipid ratio, of more than 3 is to 1 by weight. Additionally, the inner membrane is rich in an unusual phospholipid known as cardiolipin. Unlike the outer membrane, the inner membrane does not contain porins, and is highly impermeable. Therefore, almost all ions and molecules cannot pass through the inner membrane. They will be requiring special membrane transporters, to enter or exit the matrix. In addition, there is a membrane potential across the inner membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane is compartmentalized into numerous Christi, 
which expand the surface area of the membrane. The inner mitochondrial membrane serves a diverse array of functions. First, it is the site of aerobic metabolism of the cell, which includes the crucial biochemical processes of the citric acid cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. It also houses the enzymes that catalyze the final oxidation of sugars and beta-oxidation of lipids, and of course, the synthesis of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. These different activities produce nearly all the energy required for the growth and viability of the cell. This is the primary reason why the mitochondria is regarded as the powerhouse of the cell. The inner membranous space is the space between the outer and inner membranes. It serves a special role in the electron transport chain. The matrix, on the other hand, is the space enclosed by the inner mitochondrial membrane. It contains a highly concentrated mixture of hundreds of enzymes, in addition to the special mitochondrial ribosomes, tRNA, and several copies of the mitochondrial DNA genome. The matrix contains 2-4% to of the total DNA of the cell and ribosomes. The mitochondrial DNA contains genes coding for some of the proteins contained in the mitochondria. Because of these, the mitochondria can be considered a sort of secondary mini-cell. This is a mitochondrion, as seen with an electron microscope which shows a cross-section of the organelle. This image, on the other hand, shows a three-dimensional representation of the arrangement of the mitochondrial membranes. Note the smooth outer membrane, and the highly convoluted inner membrane. This inner membrane contains most of the proteins responsible for cellular respiration, and it is highly folded to provide a large surface area for this activity. In the schematic cell shown here, the interior space of the mitochondrion is colored. This slide closes our discussion on the mitochondrion and we are now ready to move to the next organelle. Let's now look at the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is a net-like system, or reticulum, of flattened, membrane-bound regions localized within the cytoplasm. Unlike the nucleus and mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum is not a singular, highly ordered entity, but an irregular and interconnected array of membranous vesicles. It is part of the endomembrane system. The basic structure and composition of the ER membrane are similar to the plasma membrane. Found in all eukaryotic cells, the endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for several specialized functions such as protein translation, folding, and transport of proteins to be used in the cell membrane, or to be secreted from the cell, the sequestration of calcium, and production and storage of glycogen, steroids, and other macromolecules. Two types are known, the rough endoplasmic reticulum also known as RER, and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum or SER. The rough endoplasmic reticulum the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum or RER is studded with protein manufacturing ribosomes, giving it a rough appearance. Hence its name. But it should be noted that these ribosomes are not resident of the endoplasmic reticulum incessantly. The ribosomes only bind to the endoplasmic reticulum once it begins to synthesize proteins destined for sorting. The ribosomes attached to the RER functions in the biosynthesis of certain membrane and organelle proteins, and other proteins to be secreted from the cell. It should be noted, as well, that the membrane of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the outer layer of the nuclear envelope. Although there is no continuous membrane between the rough ER and the Golgi apparatus, membrane-bound vesicles shuttle proteins between these two compartments. The rough endoplasmic reticulum works in concert with the Golgi complex to target new proteins to their proper destinations. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or SER, consists of tubules and vesicles that branch, forming a network. It is characterized by the absence of attached ribosomes, hence the term smooth. The SER network allows increased surface area for the action or storage of key enzymes and the products of these enzymes. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum has diverse functions in several metabolic processes, which are stated as follows. The storage, in the cisternal space, and transport of proteins, that are destined for secretion from the cell. The site of synthesis and metabolism of fatty acids and phospholipids. The site of enzymes that modify or detoxify chemicals and carcinogens, by converting them into more water-soluble conjugated products that can be secreted from the body. When whole cells are disrupted utilizing various methods, the reticulum network is randomly cleaved, and smaller fragments are eventually isolated. These reticulum pieces are termed microsomes. Additionally, it is worthwhile to note that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is known for its storage of calcium ions in muscle cells and as such will be called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
Here is a last look at the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. This is the schematic diagram of an animal cell showing the endoplasmic reticulum, as shown in green. On the other hand, this bigger image is an electron micrograph of a thin section of a mammalian cell, showing the endoplasmic reticulum. Please note that it is continuous with the membrane of the nuclear envelope. The black particles, studying the particular region of the E are shown here, are the ribosomes, the molecular assemblies that perform protein synthesis. The next organelle in our list is the Golgi apparatus. Also called the Golgi body, Golgi complex, or dictyosome, it is an organelle found in typical eukaryotic cells. It is typically comprised of a series of 5 to 8 cup shaped, membrane covered sacs, called cisterny, that look something like a stacks of deflated balloons that are localized near the nucleus. The primary function of the Golgi apparatus is to process and package macromolecules synthesized by the cell, primarily proteins and lipids. It is often referred to as the distribution and shipping department of the cell. Each Golgi stack has two distinct ends, or faces. They are the cis and the trans faces. The cis face of a Golgi stack is the end of the organelle where substances enter from the endoplasmic reticulum for processing. On the other hand, the trans face is where the processed substances exit in the form of smaller detached vesicles. Consequently, the cis face is found near the endoplasmic reticulum, from whence most of the material it receives comes. In turn, the trans face is positioned near the plasma membrane of the cell, to where many of the substances it modifies are shipped to. Cells synthesize many different macromolecules required for life. The Golgi apparatus is integral in modifying, sorting, and packaging these substances for cell secretion or for use within the cell. The functions of the Golgi body are myriad. Let us enumerate them. First, it accepts proteins from the rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum system for concentrating and packaging into dense granules which are then secreted from the cell. Next, it is also responsible for concentrating certain proteins and packaging in membrane-bound bodies, such as lysosomes, which remain in the cell. Additionally, it also aids in the post-translational glycosylation and the addition of lipids to proteins. To continue with the other functions of the Golgi body, it is also implicated as the cellular site for the biosynthesis of complex carbohydrate materials which are ultimately secreted and deposited in the exterior coating of the cell. Because of these various crucial processes, the Golgi body is also known as the traffic police of the cell. It plays a key role in sorting many of the cell's proteins and membrane constituents, and directing them to their proper destinations. A tangible example is the Golgi body's role in modifying secretory proteins, for instance, by glycosylation or phosphorylation, and packaging, and directing them to their proper sites in the cell. A last look at the Golgi apparatus. This is a schematic diagram of an animal cell, with the Golgi apparatus colored red. The next is a drawing of the Golgi apparatus reconstructed from electron microscope images. It is composed of flattened sacs of membrane stacked in layers, from which small vesicles of membrane pinch off. Only one stack is shown here, but several can be present in each cell. And this last image is the electron micrograph of the Golgi apparatus from a typical animal cell. Microbodies are small compartments found in the cytoplasm, which are surrounded by a single membrane. Nearly all eukaryotic cells contain variable numbers of microbodies ranging from 10 to 1,000 per cell. They contain a high concentration of certain proteins and enzymes, and appear as dense regions in electron microscopy. Microbodies are formed by pinching off as buds from either the Golgi body or from the rough endoplasmic reticulum smooth endoplasmic reticulum network. Microbodies include lysosomes and peroxisomes, which we will be discussing in the next few slides. Lysosomes are membrane-limited organelles that contain various types of enzymes, also known as acid hydrolases, that degrade polymers into their monomeric subunits by catalyzing the hydrolysis in these polymers. Examples of these acid hydrolases are phosphatases, nucleases, and proteases. These enzymes work only at acid pH, and are inactive at the neutral pH values of the cell, and most extracellular fluids. To enable these enzymes to function, the inside of a lysosome is maintained at about pH 4.8 by a hydrogen ion pump in the lysosomal membrane. The acid pH helps to denature proteins, and make them accessible to the action of the lysosomal hydrolases, whose structures resist acid denaturation. If a lysosome releases its contents into the cytosol, where the pH is between 7.0 and 7.3, no degradation of cytosolic components takes place. 
Here is an illustration of the various examples of acid phosphatases that are contained within the lhasosomes. Take note that these enzymes act on almost all the biomolecules, including carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and other molecules containing phosphate ester bonds. To continue, two types of lhasosomes are identified. The first is the primary lhasosome. This type of lhasosomes is roughly spherical in shape and are considered newly formed, and have not yet engaged in any cellular activity. These lysosomes are known to be in the latent phase, and do not contain obvious particulate or membrane debris. On the other hand, secondary lysosomes are larger and irregularly shaped and contain particles and membranes that are being digested. These type of lysosomes appears to result from the fusion of primary lysosomes with other membrane-bound organelles. Additionally, the content of these lysosomes seems to be released as a package into the phagoacetosome, when they fuse to form the phagolhasosome. Secondary lysosomes contain both hydrolyses and substrates. This is an illustration of the degradation of exogenous and endogenous macromolecules in the lysosome. As you can see, this illustration just reiterates the functions of lysosomes, first, the degradation of aged or defective organelles. And secondly, the degradation of extracellular macromolecules brought into the cell by endocytosis. Feel free to pause the presentation to trace the degradation of the different macromolecules and their corresponding products. Moving on, peroxisomes are a class of small, membrane-limited organelles found in the cytoplasm of all animal and many plant cells. These organelles contain various enzymes that degrade fatty acids and amino acids, reactions of which, produce hydrogen peroxide. As mentioned, peroxisomes contain enzymes that degrade fatty acids and amino acids. A byproduct of these reactions is hydrogen peroxide, a corrosive substance that oxidizes many amino acid side chains, and may cause cellular damage if in excessive amounts and left unchecked. Fortunately, the peroxisomes also contain copious amounts of the enzyme catalase, which catalyzes the conversion of toxic hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Catalase is one of the scavenging enzymes that protect the cells from oxidant damage. The cell membrane, also called the plasma membrane or plasma lemma, is a selectively permeable lipid bilayer which comprises the outer layer of a cell. It is continuous with the nuclear membrane and other intracellular membrane of various organelles. The cell membrane is a semi-permeable barrier that defines the outer perimeter of the cell. It allows nutrients to enter the cell, and filter out unwanted materials in the extracellular milieu. This is the function of transport proteins and permeases found in this membrane. The plasma lemma also prevents metabolites and ions from leaving the cell, thus playing a major role in maintaining the proper ionic composition and osmotic pressure of the cytoplasm. And lastly, the membrane serves in the communication and interaction among cells, though gap junctions and receptors found in the membranes. This is a simplified diagram of the cell coat, also known as the glycocalyx. As defined, the cell coat is a viscous layer that covers the cell membrane or cell wall. This structure consists of the oligosaccharide side chains of glycolipids, and integral membrane glycoproteins. It is also made up of the polysaccharide chains on integral membrane proteoglycans. In addition, adsorbed glycoproteins and adsorbed proteoglycans contribute to the glycocalyx in many cells. Note that all of the carbohydrates is on the non-cytoplasmic surface of the membrane. The cell coat serves a wide array of functions. First, it is crucial for cell-to-cell -cell recognition and for tissue reorganization. It also serves acts as filters to regulate the passage of molecules, thus, a highly effective diffusion barrier. And lastly, it plays a major role in cell-to-cell -cell communication, like contact inhibition, for instance. The cytoskeleton is a cellular scaffolding or skeleton contained, like all other organelles, within the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm in eukaryotic cells contains an intricate assembly of microtubule structures, all connected to a thin thread-like structure called microtrabecular strand. This lattice may also connect with other tube-like structures called myofilaments, which are associated with the cell membrane. All consist of protein molecules. The entire assembly is termed a cytoskeleton network, a highly structured network of proteinaceous filaments. The cytoskeleton elements have important functions. Their dynamic structures maintain overall cell shape, and also has been known to protect the cell. These elements also enable some cell motion and play important roles in both intracellular transport, for instance, the movement of vesicles, and organelles. It is also important in facilitating cellular division and providing surfaces on which some chemical reactions may occur. 
Lastly, the cytoplasm, also known as the cytosol, is the internal fluid of the cell. A significant list of cell metabolic processes occurs here. Important pathways, like glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, the pentose phosphate pathway, activation of amino acids, fatty acid synthesis, the last part of the urea cycle, and nucleotide synthesis, to name a few, all occur in the cytoplasm. Additionally, proteins within the cytosol play an important role in signal transduction pathways. These proteins, found in the cytosol, also act as intracellular receptors and form part of the ribosomes, enabling protein synthesis. A very important cornerstone concept of biochemistry, that puts the order in all its biomolecules, reactions, and processes is that of cellular localization, or what is known as compartmentalization. The metabolic pathways in eukaryotic cells are extensively compartmentalized by an endomembrane system. Each compartment is dedicated to specialized metabolic functions, and the enzymes appropriate to these specialized functions, are confined together within the organelle. In many instances, the enzymes of a metabolic sequence occur together within the organelle or membrane. Thus, the flow of metabolic intermediates in the cell is spatially, as well as chemically segregated. We will see a specific example of this concept illustrated, and then in play when we go to the next slide. As promised, here is a concrete example of compartmentalization in play. As we can see in the illustration shown here, the 10 enzymes of glycolysis are found in the cytosol, but pyruvate, the product of glycolysis, is fed into the mitochondria. These organelles contain the citric acid cycle enzymes, which oxidize pyruvate to carbon dioxide. The great amount of energy released in the process is captured by the oxidative phosphorylation system of mitochondrial membranes, and used to drive the formation of ATP. From here, we can clearly see and understand that the enzymes, reactions and pathways are separated, both geographically and chemically, in the different compartments, in this case, in the cytosol and the mitochondria. If we look at the big picture, metabolic pathways in eukaryotic cells, are extensively compartmentalized by the endomembrane system. Each of these cells has a true nucleus bounded by a double membrane called the nuclear envelope. The nuclear envelope is continuous with the endomembrane system, which is composed of differentiated regions, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi complex, various membrane-bounded vesicles such as lysosomes, vacuoles, and microbities, and, ultimately, the plasma membrane itself. Eukaryotic cells also possess mitochondria and, if they are photosynthetic, chloroplasts. Here is a tabulated summary of the different organelles, and the respective important metabolic processes occurring therein. Feel free to pause the presentation to read through each and every item. And this ends our lecture on the introduction to biochemistry and the biochemistry of the cell. Thank you very much for your time and attention in listening to this presentation. Again, welcome to the UST Faculty of Medicine and Surgery. We wish you good luck, have a pleasant stay, and please, always stay safe. See you all in the next lecture.